Good afternoon, and welcome to our second reading from the book, My Life as an Ice Cream Sandwich by Ibby Zavoy. And if you remember from our first reading, our protagonist, Ebony Grace, has moved from Huntsville, Alabama, where she lives with her mother and her grandfather, to visit her dad in Harlem in New York City. And she has just arrived, and um, there are a lot of kids around, and they're kind of making fun of her. So let's see. We are on Chapter 4. Hey, 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 Daddy's voice booms all through the gibberish. Y'all step away from her. She's fresh from Alabama. She's going to need her space. It's only when Daddy pulls my hands away from my ears that I open one eye to recognize Bianca Perez making her way through the crowd. She grabs my other hand, stretches her arm out in front of Pigeon Chest Boy and all the other kids standing around, and pulls me towards the steps of Daddy's brownstone. To the rescue, I say. Still, those nefarious minions stand right outside the rest of Iron Gate, shouting their comments and questions. They're nefarious because they're so rude and mean. Who yells at a stranger like that? As if they've had no home training, as Mama would say. And they're minions because they're all working under the orders of King Juli Sirius Julius, who wants them to be friends with me. But they have no manners. Hey, girls, want to go in the fire hydrant? You know how to double jump rope double dutch? I bet you she's double-handed. They don't jump double dutch down south. She looked country. Look at her knees. They all laugh and point, and I know it's a trick to get me to laugh too. Then King Sirius Julius will take me prisoner in planet No Joke City forever. I can just hear him now calling my mom and granddaddy to say, I told you she'd be happy here. Now let her stay with me. I look around for King Sirius Julius, who's already disappeared up the steps and into the brownstone, leaving me and Bianca Pluto to fend off his nefarious minions. They keep laughing and pointing, but I won't be fooled. No Joke City jokes are, aren't funny. Bianca doesn't laugh either, thank goodness. Deja la sola, she yells at the nefarious minions. Why don't you go wash off your funky bumps butts in the fire hydrant? More shouting, more questions, and more gibberish. I cover my ears and shut my eyes again until a deep thumping sound comes from somewhere down the block and reaches my bones. It forces me to stare up the gray-blue sky and hazy yellow sun. Music. Heavy bass music like a sonic boom from Planet Boombox. I can see the sound waves vibrating across the roofs of the brownstone forming a force field around all of Harlem. I stand on the steps and point. Look, I whisper. Bianca stands next to me and looks up too. I don't see nothing, she says. The sonic boom, I say, really slowly so as not to alarm anything that might be inching closer to where Bianca and I are standing. The what boom, she asks. The sonic boom, sent by the sonic king and the funkasoid from the planet Boombox. Bianca rolls her eyes and sighs. Calvin is a new boombox. You want to go watch him break dance? I look at her all crazy because now she's talking nonsense. Who wants to watch anybody dance when an evil king is sending mind-controlling sound waves over your city? Broomstick! Daddy shoves from inside the brownstone, and in an instant, the waves disappear. Ebony Grace, come on in here and wash up. you got to call your mother, and then i got some lunch for you. You can join us too, Bianca, if your granddaddy says it's all right. Daddy's telephone is at the very edge of the kitchen wall, just like Mama's down in Huntsville. Bianca runs to wash her hands in the bathroom as Daddy picks up the receiver to call Mama in Alabama. The long, spiraling cord hangs across the black and white kitchen tiles. I watch him turn the phone dial with each number, all 11 of them, starting with 1, then 256. Of course, he knows my Huntsville number by heart because he calls every Saturday morning. Our short conversations have never changed. Daddy, how's my baby girl? Me, good. Daddy, you're getting high marks in school? Me, yes. Daddy, how about you come up to the Bang Apple and stay with your daddy for a while? Me, no. And even now that I'm with him, not for a while, just a week, he still doesn't have much to say, unlike Granddaddy, who can step in and out of his imagination location with no problem. Captain Fleet, what have you got to report from your mission, Cadet, Cadet E. Grace? E. Grace. The Funkazoids have dispersed all throughout the galaxy to retrieve the Golden Dog Star. Captain Fleet, retrieve the Golden Dog Star, huh? Is that right? E. Grace, affirmative, Captain. Captain Fleet, as regular old granddaddy. Ebony Grace, are you trying to tell me you want a golden retriever for your birthday? E. Grace, affirmative, granddaddy. And I was supposed to get that golden retriever this summer, right before signing up for that new space camp. No matter, because I won't be staying in Harlem. E. Gray Starfleet won't be Planet No Joke City's prisoner forever. I'll make it back to Huntsville in time for my new puppy and space camp. 
So I try very hard not to smile big and bright as Daddy dials and my heart is beating fast waiting to hear Granddaddy's version of what's really happening here in No Joke City. Daddy has to wait a few seconds for Mama to accept the collect call from New York. Daddy always calls collect because Granddaddy is rich. Still, I've heard Mama say Daddy could spare a few dollars just to hear his daughter's voice. And I've heard Daddy say that he'd rather spend those few dollars on me when I get here to live with him for good. With my bionic ears, I hear all sorts of things I'm probably not supposed to. Bianca is back in the bathroom when Daddy's thunderous voice seems to make the whole kitchen shake. Bianca jumps and I cover my mouth to hold in a laugh. Gloria, how you feeling? All right, that's great. Well, she's here, safe and sound, and happy too, Daddy says, without even smiling or winking or nodding at me to make sure that he's right about my being happy. So I rush over to him and try to grab the phone. King Sirius Julius can fool Mama, but he can't fool me. Let me speak to her, Daddy. Hold on, broomstick. That's rude. Let me finish talking to your Mama. I step back with my face twisted into a tight knot. My arms crossed and I tap my toe in his dirty kitchen floor and listen to him lie to Mama. Her flight was fine. Yes, she was behaving. She was reading her books. I'll sign her up at the Y first thing Monday morning. I know a dance school over on 145th. I already asked Diane to watch over her while I'm at the shop. Gonna pay her too. No, I don't need your money or your daddy's. Street urchins? Gloria, those are good neighborhood kids. She's gonna be just fine and happy. When he finally hands me the phone, I step away from him as far as the cord will take me, which is all the way through the narrow hall leading to the foyer. I pull the long white cord as it spirals along the wall like a vortex. This is like the portal that Uhura has to go through when it leaves Andromeda for a whole other galaxy. Finally, I bring my phone up to my ear and I don't even wait to hear Mama's voice before I say, where's Granddaddy? Now you know better than that, Ebony Grace, Mama says. She has a way of yelling without yelling. Her voice is sweet, but her words shout, like cough syrup that's candy on my tongue, but hot peppers on my sore throat. Say you'll stay away from that dirty shop. I lift my lips and swallow hard, getting ready to give Mama my very best Funkazoid robot impression. You will stay away from that dirty shop. Bianca, who has followed me into the foyer, lets out a laugh. I move my arm like Michael Jackson in that old dancing machine video. Mama keeps sweet yelling over the phone, telling me what I should and shouldn't be doing at Daddy's house, in, the sh in his shop, and on those crazy Harlem streets with those little street urchins. Until I yell again, where's Granddaddy? Then it's as quiet as outer space. I know better than to yell at Mama, but she's all the way down in Huntsville, and fortunately she knows nothing about teleporting through spiraling portals. Little girl, she says. Now her voice is like a big round jawbreaker, still sweet but you can make you lose a tooth if you're not careful. If I could reach into that phone line and twist your little ear, I would. Now listen to me, and you listen to me good. I don't listen to her. Her words are just like the No Joke City gibberish, except it's more like having a dozen pieces of butterscotch or peppermint candy in my mouth during church and trying to sing Amazing Grace with all the other church folks, but it comes out sounding like gobble gobble. Mama's words are hard candy, gobble gobble. When she's done, it's quiet again, I ask. Can I speak to Granddaddy now? Put your father on the phone, Ebony Grace. It's all I hear and all I understand. Chapter 5. After such a long trip, I'm expecting a tall pitcher of sweet tea, fried catfish, maybe some grits or black-eyed peas, and a bowl of peach cobbler with vanilla ice cream. That's how Mama does it after Granddaddy comes back from an engineering conference. But Daddy's kitchen is dark, hot, and musty, unlike my house down in Huntsville with its brand new G General Electric air conditioner. I can barely make out two plastic plates holding a set of beige squares. Wonder Bread, slices of ham and cheese, and Hellman's mayonnaise. Daddy sets a gallon of milk and two plastic cups in front of us and walks out of the kitchen. I'm not even on my third bite before Bianca finishes all of her sandwich and pours us both some milk. Even if I did finish my sandwich, I'd still be hungry. Already, I miss Mama's cooking and Granddaddy's voice and stories. But Bianca is almost like home. The way she just sits there with me like as if I'd never left, as if we're both still nine, pretending to be astronauts. That's when I first gave her the name Bianca Pluto, first officer on the Uhura. We'd been friends ever since we first met when I was five, when Mama and Daddy were trying to make things right again. After Mama and Daddy got divorced, Daddy moved back to Harlem from Huntsville to start his own business, the auto repair shop and junkyard at the corner. I was only four. A year later, Mom and I visited Daddy for the first time, and for that whole summer we were like a family again, until we had to leave because Mama said the schools and streets weren't very good in Harlem. 
When I first met Bianca, Mama had been in the same kitchen, making something really good, I'm sure, when a lady holding a little girl's hand rang her doorbell. Daddy was standing in the middle of the living room, shaking his head at me when he saw what I had done to the telephone. He once told me it was the fourth phone he'd rented from Ma Bell since I figured out how to unplug a phone cord and turn a screwdriver. And that's exactly how Bianca saw me that first day. Built screwdriver in my hand and my legs wrapped in the cord. She pulled away from her abuela to help untangle me. She stayed for a long time while after that and came back the next day. When she brought her baby doll to share, she didn't mind that I took the little eyes out just to see what made them open and close. Soon, Bianca was breaking things and putting them back together with me too. I'm pulling out the ham and cheese to just eat the Wonder Bread when Bianca starts laughing. Why are you doing that? Abuela would beat your butt for wasting food. Are you trying to trick me with all that laughing? Huh? The Funkazoids chased E. Grace Starfleet all the way to Planet No Joke City. Did you see the signal the sun at King sent us? I say, pulling off the crust and the bread. What signal? The sound waves, the sonic boom. I watch her face, the brown eyes, the curly jet black hair, the milk mustache. Her shirt is too tight because she's blossoming, as Mama would say, and I don't like all the striped colors in it, the pinks, blues, and purples. I make sure to lend her some of my clothes that I sneaked into my suitcase, my NASA, Superman, and Empire Strikes Back t-shirts, even the new E.T. one that I got from a boy at my old school. I traded it for a Transformers t-shirt. I have to hide all these sheets for shirts from Mama, who thinks little ladies ought to dress accordingly. Bianca just shakes her head as if she doesn't know what I'm talking about. So I try again. We're going to have to stop King Sirius Julius from keeping me as prisoner. You have to help me find the Uhura so we can save Captain Fleet. She shrugs. You want to go in the fire hydrant instead? Then we can go dry our clothes in the park. Or maybe we could jump some double dutch. When my sneakers are wet and I'm jumping rope, they make a squishy sound and it's like music when we sing, Jack, be nimble, Jack, be quick. No, let's go check out the junkyard instead. Is my old rocket ship still there? The one that made it to the moon? Maybe we can use that to get to the Uhura. My very first summer in Harlem without Mama was when I was nine. Bianca and I spent almost every single day in the junkyard behind Daddy's shop. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere out of Daddy's sight, but Daddy's sight was always under the hood of a car or on some car rusty car parts. On one of these those days, I sat by the window of Daddy's brownstone all morning, waiting for a giant storm cloud to ease up from New Jersey and Central Park and sit its wide, cloudy butt right over Harlem. When it finally crossed 125th Street, the hot August sun had nothing else to do but back off and mind his own beeswax. I pulled away from the window and hurried down three long flights of creaky stairs to the ground floor apartment. I knocked really hard three times. Bianca had opened the door holding her toothbox and wearing a smile, her toolbox and wearing a smile as bright as Nina's. It's time, I whispered. Come on, we gotta hurry. We ran next door to the shop where cars were lined up with hoods open in the front yard. Past the broken cars was the glass door to the shop left wide open to let out the heat and all the car grease smells. Daddy was in front of the counter talking to one of the mechanics. I grabbed Bianca's hand and ran to the back of the shop where the huge rolling gate was halfway up so we could just run straight into the junkyard. We'd already set up a blue tarp in the middle of the yard where scrap metal, car parts, broken appliances, and even pieces of a staircase from somebody's building were stacked along the gate. To the far right of the yard was an old supermarket refrigerator where Bianca and I kept our supplies. Albert, the shop's guard dog, was at my legs, wagging his tail when I opened the refrigerator door and reached down for my toolbox. I petted the old lab just as thunder ripped through the sky. Albert whined and headed for cover beneath the car doors. Bianca and I started setting up on top of the old blue tarp. She pulled out two empty soda bottles, a broken toilet plunger, a wrench, a pair of scissors, goggles, and a whistle. What's the whistle for, I asked. For when our rocket ship breaks the sound barrier, Bianca said. But wait, did you bring earmuffs? It's not going to even reach Mach 1, Bianca. we got to get it out of the junkyard and then out of Harlem first, I said, shaking my head. Pulled out my supplies, aluminum foil, duct tape, three PVC pipes, and a pack of Granddaddy's seltzer tablets all the way from Huntsville. I hummed the theme music from Star Trek. Space, the final frontier, I said, deepening my voice as I gathered my all my materials in front of me to boldly go where no muchacha has gone before. Bianca added, you think it'll get to the Bronx? Maybe land on the Grand Concourse? And call my tío Jorge to catch it for us. Bianca held a pipe to her eye and looked up toward the sky. Who cares about the Bronx when you get to Jupiter and Saturn and beyond, I said. I placed the toolbox next to Bianca and looked around the junkyard for any noisy bystanders, like the boys from down the block who used the junkyard for kickball games. But thank goodness the storm had chased them all into their apartments. They're not into rockets anyway. I glanced up at the dark gray sky, perfect for launching so we wouldn't go blind from staring at the sun. 
Plus, when the storm clouds hung low, it looked as if outer space were close enough for us to just tiptoe and touch. Harlem only got quiet during thunderstorms. No one could be outside getting their hot combed dues, jerry curls, and white Adidas all messed up, so it sounded as if the whole universe could hear our countdown. Another roar of thunder made all Harlem tremble and a single raindrop landed on my nose. Let's hurry, I yelled to Bianca. And here you see cartoon in the middle of this book. They're sitting there making their bottle rocket. Duct tape, duct tape, seltzer tablet, here you go. How far do you think it'll go, Captain? E. Gray Starfleet. To boldly go where no girl has gone before. So that'll be about 100 kilometers before it makes a hole in that giant storm cloud and reaches our atmosphere. And then another 240,000 before it pokes the moon right in the eye. T minus 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. To the moon, lift off. A la luna. And there's their bottle rocket going off. And then you can see they've imagined it to be a spaceship. Chapter 6. When we're done with our lunches, Bianca and I head out to Daddy's shop. I look up at a faded red and blue sign that used to say Freeman's Auto Pair. Now it just reads, Man's Au Pair. The shadows of the missing letters are like ghosts, and maybe we need to call the Ghostbusters to get those missing letters back. The red is now a dull pink and the blue is more gray as if it had been way more than three years since I last saw that sign. A rolling thunderclap makes my insides drop and I quickly look toward the above ground train tracks at the end of the block, but there's no train. I look up and down the street. The brownstones are lined up next to one another like soldiers, broken, raggedy soldiers. Some are now boarded up with padlock chains hanging in the front of wooden slats instead of doors. A few brownstones have missing window panes and even steps. A giant cardboard box surrounded by shopping carts sits in one of the front of one of the buildings. Suddenly, the soul train comes speeding down the above ground tracks at the end of the block with a roll and a thunder and a thunder and a roll. My eyes almost pop right out of my head and I take a gulp of that no joke city air. The soul train, I sing. Then I quickly cover my mouth because a smile, then a laugh, and then a boogie down dance is starting to take over my whole body, my whole soul, almost like the ladies who catch the Holy Ghost in Mama's church. That's not the soul train, Bianca says. That's the Harlem line. Well, my daddy says the same thing, I say, uncovering my mouth and watching the very last car of the train speed past our block. Nuh-uh, Bianca says, rolling her neck. Uh-huh, I say. She shakes her head. Then I whisper, well, it's the sonic boom. The sonic boom is destroying everything. Down the block is an empty lot where some of the kids who've been in the fire hydrant are playing. I can't tell from where I'm standing, but they're jumping on something wide, square, and springy. A mattress, maybe. Who would bring a mattress out into an open lot? Let's go over there, Bianca says, grabbing my hand. I quickly let go. The junkyard is better. I'm not going to that junkyard. It's dirty and junky. Calvin and them are in the lot. You mean to tell me that's not junky and, j junky and dirty too? I say, pointing to the lot with old big metal trash bins that Daddy said were oil drums, old tires, and torn mattress. And of course, the nefarious minions. I've never seen such tr this much trash in Huntsville. The garbage man comes down Old Stone Road twice a week, and it's granddaddy's job to put our metal bin out on the sidewalk, but no one ever, ever puts trash in the street. And surely there's nothing funny about that. No joke city, all right. Someone shouts Bianca's name, and we both turn to see another group of nefarious minions. All girls wearing short shorts, too small, and two colorful t-shirts, and each one holding on to a long white telephone cord. They walk across the street to where Bianca and I are standing. I can tell right away there's a leader, a girl with two long swinging ponytails wearing a rainbow bright t-shirt. Is this your friend from Alabama that you were talking about? Rainbow Bell starts to say even before she reaches the sidewalk. She and her mignonettes keep their eyes on me and my pleated skirt, lace socks, Mary Jane shoes, and stupid curls. I wish I'd chained into an appropriate E-Gray Starfleet uniform before braving the streets of No Joke City. Bianca nods. This is Ebony. So you two are Ebony and Ivory singing together in perfect harmony, Rainbow Bell asks. What happened to PJ, Bianca? What a stupid thing to say, even though I know it's from that Stevie Wonder and Paul McCartney song that Mama likes. So I ask, who's PJ? Her boyfriend. No, he's not, Bianca shouts. The nefarious mignonettes giggle. Another ploy, as Captain Fleet would say, to get me to smile, giggle, or laugh, too. I throw my brows even deeper this time and stare at each one of them, narrowing my fist, tightening my jaw, and clenching my fist. You look like you want to punch somebody, Rainbow Doll says, 
An avalanche of no-joke city gibberish pours out of everyone's mouth like shooting lasers from a spaceship. You want to fight? Why is she so weird? Why does she have on church clothes? Let me hear you talk country. They don't know how to fight down south. I block their laser beam gibberish by throwing up my arms like Wonder Woman with her bracelets of submission. Pew, pew, I say with each swing of my arms. What is wrong with your friend? One of the minionettes asks. Ebony, stop acting weird, Bianca says. But her words are laser shots, and I block them too. Pew, pew. Stop it, Bianca yells through her clenched teeth. But I have to protect myself and her. They've got you too, Bianca Pluto. Save yourself. Block the gibberish laser beams with your braids. Bracelets of submission. She grabs both my arms to stop me, but I pull away. I'm not going to let you take me prisoner. I yell over to the laughing minionettes. What are you talking about, Bianca yells back. You know what? Never mind. She reaches into a teeny pocket in front of her striped shirt and pulls out a small fold of green paper that opens up into a clean, crisp $5 bill, and she smacks it over the bony part of the chest of my chest. Your daddy gave me five bucks to be your friend. I grab the five before it falls to the ground and look at it. Five bucks to be my friend? I say almost whispering. I'm going to need at least 20 bucks just to put up with all this loco. Loca, Bianca says. The minionettes laugh even harder and louder. One of them takes her index finger and swirls it around near her temple, a mind-controlling trick, so I shut my eyes and cover my ears. I should have known that Bianca Pluto had already been taken prisoner. I have to save myself first, then I can save her. E. Gray Starfleet will not fall under the hypnotic spell of a sonic boom. I let the minionettes walk away from Bianca Pluto. If you can hear me, Bianca Pluto, make sure you use your secret spying senses to get all the information you need from the nefarious minions to defeat the evil Sonic King, the Funkazoids, and the Sonic Boom. I shout into the steamy no-joke city air and hope it reaches Bianca Pluto's bionic ears in time. But she only looks back from the crowd of nefarious minionettes, shaking her head and rolling her eyes. I throw up my left arm with my invisible bracelet submission one more time, just in case the minionettes have secretly sent a gibberish laser beam my way. Pew! I've crushed them. And that's enough for today. I hope you enjoyed this reading from... My life is an ice cream sandwich. Looks like Ebony perhaps needs to grow up a little. I don't know. It sounds like her friends have kind of grown up a little bit more than she has. So it'll be interesting to see how they're going to get along and how long she's going to end up staying in Harlem. Again, it's My Life as an Ice Cream Sandwich by Ibby Savoy. Thanks and have a great day.